So I'm going to talk, uh, Bob and I sort of divided the, uh, the transportation world a little bit here. I'm going to talk, uh, picking up on the theme of the video, a little bit about what's going on with high-speed rail. Uh, and then Bob's going to talk about what's going on with the federal transportation program and, and uh, more, more about highways and stuff. Um, but the, here's the really the, the key for, for making this whole session quite easy is the budget deal that just passed basically stripped all of the high-speed rail funding, all the federal funding for high-speed rail out of the budget. So roughly $3 billion for high-speed rail that was planned is gone. And so that, that's it for high-speed rail. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, that's not it by a long stretch because uh, it's, a, you know, uh, uh, high-speed rail is holy and you can't just walk away from something that's holy just because there's no money. Um, the, now, the thing with high-speed rail is that I want to make really clear is high-speed rail is a great technology. It's a great system. Uh, I have ridden a number of high-speed rail lines around the world. They rock, um, and I think in the future they're going to be part of the way people travel uh, in many, many parts of the world, including the United States. The problem is the way that planners are using the technology in the United States. It's not the technology, it's the fact that we have really lousy planners in the United States. Well, they're planners, right? <laughs> So, the, and the planners are abusing this technology uh, uh, viciously. So you have, uh, and I'll touch as I go along on, on specific projects out there, but just for example, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the projects that is in line, was in line for federal funding and is still clamoring for federal funding is a Chicago to St. Louis line. Now there's already an Amtrak line that runs there. And uh, it takes, the, that trip takes three hours and 40 minutes, I think, uh, right now. Three hours and 48 minutes, that's what it is. And the plan is to spend $2 billion to upgrade that line to high-speed rail, which will knock that trip down to three hours and 18 minutes. <laughs> Two billion, 20 minutes? What a deal! <laughs> oh, and that's for say eight, eight or 9,000 people that ride it each year. So, yeah. Wow, their time must be really valuable. Uh, <laughs> so you have a number of the systems that have been proposed are not really high-speed rail, that they're, they're slightly faster speed rail projects um, like that one. You know, you're, you're essentially adding 15 miles an hour to a train line that runs you know, through a couple, three states and you're gonna spend billions of dollars to achieve that. So not exactly uh, revolutionary. Now the good news is, is the Missouri legislature, uh, which is on the hook to pay for a substantial chunk of that project, just said hell no, <laughs> and cut it completely out of their budget as well. So that project is, uh, is at least for now, dead. Um, the fundamental, the fundamental problem with these high-speed rail plans in the United States is our issues of risk. Now, I have an 11-year-old daughter who has a strong entrepreneurial streak. She wants to run her own business really bad. And most of her business ideas are, you know, it, it's, it's terrible when you're a parent and you have to explain to the kids, yeah, you don't want to just say, no, that's not possible. You know, you don't want to rain on their parade, but I mean, some of them are really just not possible. So they always have to strike that balance. But uh, so she's always trying to come up with these businesses. We homeschool our kids, so uh, as they constantly complain, it turns out everything we do somehow winds up becoming school. Uh, so they can't ever quite escape the clutches of of that. So she did come up with a business idea, and because everything is school, we said, well, if you're going to start a business, you know, you've got, you're going to learn about how business works, so you're going to have to come up with a business plan, you know, a budget, projections, all of this stuff. We're going to loan you the startup capital, you have to pay it back with interest, all of this stuff. And uh, so she did, she went through all this, and this business was, she was going to buy a bunch of chicks uh, and raise them uh, and sell them as laying hens because she learned through various conversations that there was a lot of demand for laying hens 
in our community from people who didn't want to go through the trouble of buying chicks and raising them up themselves. So she worked it all out. She had her plan. She, uh, she, she sketched it all out. She, she, her, her, if everything worked out according to her plan, she'd make about $250 in profit. And so she, she launched the business and she just wrapped this up about a month ago. And we had a really bad winter storm, uh, deep snow, nine chick young chickens died in that storm. And uh, a hawk <laughs> plucked one right out of our backyard one day. <laughs> and another one got stuck and kind of wedged itself under a shed and apparently couldn't figure out how to get out and just croaked. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so she had some attrition and none of that was in her plan. And uh, so she wound up still making, uh, making a, a decent profit, but not nearly what she planned, and that was because she had no risk in her plan whatsoever. Her plan was entirely based on everything working exactly right. And this is just like high-speed rail. I told her, yeah, you should put you on the high-speed rail authority, honey. You know, you'd, be, you'd fit right in. Because there's no risk in building high-speed rail. It's all, it's all sunshine and roses in the future. We just build these things and people ride them and it you know, saves, us, saves us from climate change. Uh, and uh, everybody, everybody drives happy and, and it's more communal than driving and, and so on and so forth. But no, the, 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 these things are fraught with risk. And that was actually the core of David mentioned at the opening dinner and it's come up uh, subsequently that you know, Governor Scott in, in Florida killed this plan to build a high-speed rail line from Tampa to Orlando, um, which, you know, I mean, come on, that doesn't even pass the laugh test. Uh, and yet, it was passing the spend hundreds of millions of dollars on it test at the state legislature and the federal government. Um, so, you know, apparently that wasn't enough money to laugh about for them, but the, uh, the plan was predicated on the rosiest possible scenarios uh, that no possible downside, no, no, no way would people choose the much faster option of renting a car in Tampa and driving to Orlando rather than somehow getting to the Tampa station, riding to Orlando and then renting a car there because that's the only way you can get anywhere in Orlando. <laughs> so it's a one hour trip by the rental car. It's a, it's a 49 minute trip on the high speed rail line. So you can see why to save that 11 minutes and, uh, uh, you know, it would be much better than, than and renting a car to drive a few miles instead of, it, it just didn't, it didn't add up. And so we published a report that essentially broke this down and said, look, let's assume a little bit more reasonable facts about how many people would actually want to ride the train from Tampa to Orlando. Still extraordinarily generous, but just a little bit more reasonable. Uh, let's assume that you won't have this incredible growth. I mean, they, had, they said, well, look, if this train is there, what will happen is people who work in Orlando will start to buy houses along this high-speed rail line, and then they'll use it to commute into uh, Orlando, and we'll get a bunch of ridership from that. Never mind the system wasn't designed to serve that. If you had to stop to pick up all these riders, it wouldn't be high-speed rail anymore. And there was, the development wasn't going that direction. The, you know, there was a few risks there, let's just say. Uh, no, we leave all that out of the plan. And the bottom line was, is we, we project, look, if everything doesn't go exactly according to this rosy scenario plan, if some of these risks manifest, then somebody's going to have to come up with a few hundred million bucks. And who is that according to the deal that exists? Who's that going to be? Well, now, the state of Florida had been saying, well, it's the private sector. That's, they're going to invest in this project, and they're going to take that risk, and they'll wind up paying it if it comes to pass. And the private sector is saying, those are pretty much guaranteed losses. We don't invest in guaranteed losses very often. Uh, so no, no, that wasn't going to happen. This idea that somehow you could privatize the downside of, of these projects was embedded in the state government, which goes to show there were obviously no business people in the state legislature in Florida or the Department of Transportation. So that's, and that's what it took to kill it, was we just had to point out, look, there are risks. We can argue all day about how big they are, but everybody accepts there's risks that are left out, you know, once you point them out. And it's the Florida taxpayers who are going to have to pay for those risks. Do you want that? And you know, his position from the beginning is, you know, unless you can prove to me that there's no way ever we would have to spend more money on it, I'm not going to support it. And since we can pretty thoroughly prove that for sure you're going to have to spend more money on this thing, that was, that was the deal killer. 
So move across the country to California, where you have really the one remaining project out of all the live projects right now that's high speed. So the other ha half a dozen or so really viable, vi viable, <laughs> uh, no, let's say the other half a dozen or so projects out there that have a reasonable chance of sucking up a bunch of taxpayer money to be built, um, uh, they're all this sort of moving from low speed rail to slightly less low speed rail. The real you know, bullet train project is in California. So in California, they want to build this from ultimately from San Diego to San Francisco uh, with a branch connecting in Sacramento. Uh, the starting f phase is the LA to San Francisco chunk. Um, but you still have to, that's a long stretch. You still got to start building a piece somewhere. So after lengthy negotiations with all the stakeholder groups, the environmentalists, and the landowners and the federal government who was putting in two and a half billion dollars up front into this and the states got 10 billion to get it started but that's okay it's an 80 billion project this is just the starter money uh, they just they worked out where they're going to start building this line and where they're going to build the first segment of this line is from a little town just north of the massive metropolis of Bakersfield, California, <laughs> up north to a little town just south of that slightly more massive metropolis of Fresno, California. <laughs> so the first segment of the train will literally go from a town of 25,000 to a town of 17,000. And that's going to be the opening project. That's going to be the champagne bottle busting uh, or maybe it should be a cow pie, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, what could be more laughable? Universally, people look at that and just say, you got to be kidding me. But no, no, if you're in the ISB rail business, what are you, we're not joking about this. This is where, we're, because this is the loss leader. See, the government has to step in and build this part where, you know, the private sector can't make any money between Bakersfield and Fresno, or between not quite Bakersfield and not quite Fresno. Because actually connecting two real cities, that would be crazy. Uh, no, we're going to do that, and then the private sector will jump on and build the rest of it up to San Francisco because you know all of those 17,000 people will be riding that train to carry their pigs to market or something. And so we'll, we'll have a base for building the market. Uh, it, 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 I mean, no, Jay Leno couldn't even figure out how to make up something more absurd than this. So uh, it's... And the killer, the killer is in when you look at all these projects, uh, and the, the thing about high-speed rail and the thing about these risks is they're really locked in risks. You know, if you open a new airport, uh, if you build a new road, if you, uh, you know, build a dam, if, you know, there's a lot of things you can build um, that if they don't work out, uh, there's, you have alternatives. Um, High-speed high rail, there's not a lot. Once you lay that rail, if not enough people ride it, there's not a whole lot you can do with those tracks <laughs> to uh, you know, say, well, gee, the, the rail, whole rail thing didn't work out. I don't know. You know let's, uh, let's put those pump handle cars on there and, and you know, sell it as a, as a fitness center. I don't know. You know <laughs> not much you can do with this thing. Um, and uh, you know you can you can shoot movies on it. You know, every, in California, everything always has that movie set potential. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you if you start an airline between Bakersfield and Fresno, you know, it's nice little uh, turboprop planes, and that doesn't work out well. You know, those planes there's always going to be somewhere where those planes can make money. So you do, you don't have to invest a lot. Uh, you build a high-speed rail line there, and you're building something that's going to cost a fortune. And if it doesn't work out, you can't get any of that money back. So it's really locked in risk. So it's a, it's, there's, there's sort of a, the two edges to the sword. You're taking a huge amount of risk and you got no way to wiggle out of it should those risks all manifest. Um, but the most, the thing I keep coming back to as I talk to various groups about high-speed rail is you, you kind of have to deal with the fundamental issue of, you know, the hope of the future, the hope for the future of travel that high-speed rail manifests. It's like, if we had this high-speed rail network, when you hear Joe Biden and, and President Obama talk about it, you know, they have this vision of 
high-speed rail connecting all the major cities of the US, and that's the way people are going to travel. Now, because, because that's what they do in Europe and Asia. So we're clearly behind Europe and Asia. So, you know, it's, it, it's not a fantasy. It's not hope. It's we're looking at the real world and we're trying to catch up um, is the standard story. But there's a lot of things wrong with that standard story. Uh, for, for starters, we all traveled between cities by rail back in the day. So rewind 100 years and all over the world, inner city travel was by train. That's, that was the technology 100 years ago in the US, in Europe, in Asia, everywhere. So once upon a time, everyone got between cities by train. And then what happened? Well, there was this World War II thing. And at the end of World War II, for a lot of reasons, the US uh, took a, diver a divergent, maybe not an entirely divergent path, but we, we took a, a path at a pace that was much different from the rest of the world. We started rolling out, we used the, 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 the industry that developed during the war to build cars, and cars became ubiquitous and affordable. Uh, we also had an explosion in the middle class in the post-war period. So we not only had the ability to make cheap cars, but we had lots of people who could afford relatively cheap cars at the same time. And so we did. And people could not wait to get out of those damn trains and get into a car. The trains were there. That was the competition between trains and cars. And people fled those trains as fast as they could in order to ride in cars between cities. And at the same time, you had the you had airline industry developing and flights. But you know, during most of the 50s and 60s, flying was strictly something for the rich. So that wasn't the big deal. It was the cars that was the big deal. Now, in Europe and in Asia, they're going through exactly the same thing. Just 35 years later. Uh, you know, in, in China, in Japan, in Australia, in all of Europe, people are abandoning rail for cars. And that's in a situation where everybody rode trains in the post-war period in between cities in Europe and Asia. And as they started building high-speed rail lines in those countries, it was just an upgrade. Like, if you're riding the train to see grandma three times a year, and they build a high-speed train, of course you're going to use the high-speed train. It's just an upgrade in the service that you have available, uh, especially if it's subsidized and affordable, as all of these systems are. All of the high-speed rail systems in the world are subsidized. Um, so no-brainer. They never, never in Europe at any point in time or in Asia have they tried to get people to get out of cars and get onto trains. They have built high-speed ra rail lines to get people out of slow trains and into fast trains. Now, getting people out of slow trains into fast trains is kind of a no-brainer. Getting people out of cars into trains is a different proposition, but that is exactly what we propose to do in the United States, is we're going to get people out of Southwest and out of their cars and get them into trains. No one in the world has ever done that. So it's an untested <laughs> belief. And it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't pass muster. It's not, uh, in, in the plans that exist, like in California, it's not going to be faster, it's not going to be cheaper, it's not going to be more convenient. It could be cheaper if the government decides to ridiculously subsidize it. But that's the only way it's going to be a lot cheaper uh, a way to travel. Um, then you have the sort of the real killer, which is in Europe and Asia, gasoline taxes are three times on average what they are in the US. Uh, most of the major inner city highways in those countries are toll roads. So people have to pay more to drive between the cities. And again, they have this history. They always use trains to go between cities. Now they have the option of faster trains. So if you get that, wow, it's massively more expensive to drive between cities. I've got subsidized high-speed rail to replace the low-speed rail I always used. Why would I drive between cities? And yet, the growth in Europe in inner city travel is in flying and driving, not trains. High-speed rail is still there. It's still popular. It still carries a lot of travel, but it's not the growing market share. People are increasingly willing to pay much more in order to drive or to fly because now it's cheaper and cheaper to fly. So 
this, this whole myth that somehow Asia and, and, and Europe represent a path that we have not taken is completely fundamentally wrong in all of its important details. So the, the last thing I want to say about this is it, it struck, struck me for a while as really interesting uh, how much of government policy, you know, we, we all make fun of this, right? So everything's for the children. You know, that seems to drive so much of, of policy these days. And, and so we have constant questions of, we need to make these radical investments. We need to curtail our current behavior, our current consumption, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, in, in order to be able to, you know, not undermine our children's future or in order to elevate our children's future, right? One or the other. It's, for some reason, that doesn't translate into transportation. So we have a system right now that carries, oh, you know, 98, well, 99% of all personal travel, uh, of personal surface travel, which is the highways, not the rail lines, um, that carries the vast majority of the goods and, that, are, that are moved around the country, and which we have been beggaring for 25 years. For 25 years, we have been systematically under spending, under maintaining the road system that carries everybody. So we're, you know, we're, we're deliberately and systematically undermining the transportation system that our kids are going to have to use. Uh, now, this idea that, oh, well, we build a high-speed rail system, well, at least they would be able to take a subsidized trip between cities uh, on this high-speed rail system, maybe, but that's not going to help them get, get to work or anything practical like that, anything in day-to-day -day life. So, and the proposal is to take more money away from the system that we actually use in order to build this high-speed rail system. So we're even going to accelerate the deterioration of the system that our kids are going to have to use to accomplish this. So it's a, you know, boy, how can we double down on a bad bet here, you know? Uh, the, uh, the fundamental trade-off there is, is not explicitly recognized, you know, they somehow think we can you know, have our cake and eat it too. And I just look at, we, we did an analysis of 50 largest cities in the United States and how they spend their transportation monies. In most of the 50 largest cities in the United States, they are spending between 40 and 60% of all spending, all transportation spending, sorry, all transportation spending is being spent on the public transit system. So that's the subways and the buses and the light, light rail. Okay, and those systems are in all of those cities carrying less than 3% of the people. So how long can you spend 50% of your money on 3% of the market and expect that to be sustainable, to use their term? Well, not. It's, I mean, we are, that is systematically taking the system that's carrying 97% of the people and letting it fall apart in order to spend more on the system that carries 3%. Now, if that 3% had been growing, if over those 25 years that this has been happening, we'd gone from 3% to 10% to 15% or something of the people using that system, maybe there would be something there, but what have we done? We've gone from 2.9% to 2.8%. So overspending by those orders of magnitude has actually decreased the market share of that system. So there is no amount of money probably that you could spend on these rail transit systems that would reverse this decline and make this make sense. So, you know, for the children, let's actually uh, invest in the system that carries people, and that's what Bob's gonna talk about. We hadn't planned this out quite in detail, but this is the best setup I could imagine for what I'm gonna talk about. What I'm now gonna turn to is the highway system primarily and what is going on in Washington right now this year that could fundamentally change uh, 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 how this is going. Is it on the screen? Are you seeing it? Yeah, it is. It is, okay. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, here, it's a summary points. Uh, what the federal government is currently doing in surface transportation, which is mostly highways but some transit and, and this new high-speed rail fantasy is not at all sustainable. The Obama administration is trying to use this year's reauthorization of the whole federal program, which only happens about every six years, 
to make a fundamental change and force drivers, i.e. you and me, to pay for all sorts of, of other stuff, bigger investments in transit, high-speed rail, and so forth, and scaling back investment in highways. Fortunately, we had an election last fall, and the House Republicans are, seem to be pretty much opposed to this and are focused on scaling back the federal role, which is exactly the opposite of the Obama administration's transportation plan. And, but it, crucial in this whole debate is that the user, user's pay, user's benefit principle on which highway funding has been based in this country since 1919, when Oregon enacted the first gasoline tax specifically as a user charge for, for better highways, that is seriously at risk. There are powerful forces trying to just destroy that principle and turn gasoline taxes into a general funding source. So, First, as Adrian said, uh, uh, there's been all kinds of studies the last five years uh, giving up-to-date figures on how much we're under-investing in the highways on which most of our goods and almost all of our personal travel uh, depend. Uh, the cost, the, the interstate highway system was started under, the, under Eisenhower in 1956 and completed in mostly in the 70s and a little bit on into the 80s. Highways, even with proper maintenance, typically last about 50 years. And at that point, you really have to rebuild them fundamentally down to the sub-pavement level. And when you do that, uh, you know, time goes on. There's much better safety standards today, design practices and so forth, things that we did in the 50s that no one would think of doing today because they're not state-of-the-art design. So it makes sense when you do reconstruct a major highway to use today's modern standards and so forth. Uh, and in many cases, you need to add capacity because the country has grown a hell of a lot since the 1950s. In addition, the interstate map the map of what the network would consist of was drawn up during World War II for an America that was largely an industrial economy with still a, mu with a much larger agricultural sector uh, in terms of, of employment and with cities in the, in the South and the West that were a fraction of the size of what the thriving metropolises are today. There is no interstate route if you look at the map between Phoenix and Las Vegas because it during World War II, Phoenix and Las Vegas were these tiny little cow towns. Uh, no one saw any need to connect them with there. So there are selected additions that actually are needed to make a better network. None of that is in anybody's uh, serious plans uh, at this point. Uh, the highway funding shortfall has been estimated probably the best, most recent estimate is that at all levels of government, this about highways and all streets and roads together, just to sustain the current uh, level of pavement quality, the level of bridge repair and so forth, and the performance level, not, you know, in other words, to make sure congestion doesn't get any worse than the horrendous level that it already is today. We should be, as a nation, spending at all levels of government 27 billion a year more than we're spending now. It's not a trivial number. To improve conditions, to uh, get the backlog of uh, substandard bridges way down, to make a significant improvement, reductions in congestion so that travel speeds up, we should be spending about 59 billion a year more. Now, how that's divided up between federal, state, and local is a whole different question. But the federal government is a major player at this point, uh, providing about, through federal gasoline taxes, about, what is it, about 40% of, of, of the total of all of this money. So it's a significant role. Now, just a quick primer, highways are funded today. Gasoline taxes as a dedicated funding sources for highways were invented in the early part of the 20th century. Oregon, as I said, passed the first one in 1919. And over the next 15 years, every state, every all those other states passed gasoline taxes. In many cases, uh, they, the state constitution was amended to guarantee that the state highway trust fund could only be spent, that user pays money could only be spent to benefit the highway users, only been to be spent on highways. That principle has been watered down at the state level over the years, but quite a few states still have a constitutional protection. At the federal level, the feds enacted a one cent per gallon gas tax in 1932, but it was a general revenue tax. It was not at all dedicated to highways. There was, during that same time period, beginnings of a federal aid to highways program pushed for by the auto clubs and, and others. But uh, there was no direct connection with the gasoline tax. It was not a user tax, per se, dedicated to highways. That changed, though, with the, with the Interstate Act in 1956, when a new three-cent federal gasoline tax was enacted specifically to build the interstate highway system. Uh, and the a federal highway trust fund 
again, not with constitutional protection, unfortunately, but dedicated to spending to build that system and to maintain it once it was built, was created. And that was 100% for those highways. Now, the, this principle, the user pays, user benefits, something that we at Reason Foundation strongly believe makes sense. The ideal thing would be toll roads, obviously, because that's an even more direct user fee, and the toll can vary more. You know, the gasoline tax is the same whether you're driving on a two-lane road or an eight-lane interstate. And you know, that, but highways cost a lot different. So a tolling system would uh, have higher charges for the more expensive, higher quality roads, and much lower charges for the others. But still, a gasoline tax at least is an approximation of a user pay, user benefit thing, as long as the money that's collected is actually spent on, on, on the, to benefit highway users. It's fair, it's proportional to how much you use. Uh, it's self-limiting. Europe's gasoline taxes are not at all dedicated to highways. They're a general federal government, re national government revenue source. Highways have to fight for a budget allocation like welfare and, and you know, government health care and everything else. They get whatever they get. And that's one reason they don't get very much is why there's so many toll roads in Europe. Because that's a way you can actually get decent highways despite paying outrageous gasoline taxes. So. But what we've happened since the interstate, you know, Congress loves to uh, attract votes by uh, spending money on special interest projects. So every time Congress reauthorizes the federal program, they think of something new to spend the money on. So in 1970, they added it could be spent on bus facilities. Well, buses use the road, so all right. Then in 1973, they added rail facilities. Whoops. Where, ha what happened to the user's benefit uh, principle? 1982, under Ronald Reagan, he agreed to this historic creation of the mass transit account in the Federal Highway Trust Fund. 20% as of 1982 of all the federal gas tax revenues, and it's gas and diesel, trucks pay too, uh, now ever since goes into the mass transit account and is grants for cities to uh, uh, expand and build bigger and better mass transit systems. 1991, they made two big programs in the, in the overall federal highway program, flexible, which means if the state wants to, they can divert highway money out of those accounts into transit, in addition to the transit account that they already got. Uh, there's more of that in the, in the authorizations, the next two. And today, we did analysis, 12 or 25% of all highway trust fund monies are used for non-highway purposes. And so that's a significant devaluing of the user's pay, user's benefit principle at the federal level. And what the administration has now proposed in their transportation bill uh, to be uh, debated this year is basically converting highway user taxes into general purpose transportation taxes. There would be a overall transportation trust fund uh, with one account for highways, which would get less money than they're getting now. Another account for mass transit, which would get more money than transit is getting now. A whole big new account for high-speed rail to make it permanent institutionalized. And another one called an infrastructure fund that could fund anything that could be called transportation infrastructure. You know, uh, uh, boondoggle waterways projects and, and uh, port projects and so forth. Again, presumably all paid for by highway use, although the administration has not come clean and said how they're proposing to more than double the size of the program. Uh, without saying where the rest of the money would come from, it would require adding to the current 18.4 cent a gallon gasoline tax, would, you'd add another 26 and a half cents per gallon to, uh, to, to fund this whole thing at the level that, that they propose it. And even there, within the smaller amount that they dedicate to highways, 27 and a half billion of that over six years would be dedicated to livability. This is what they call a, a, a highway money, not the transit money. But it would go for sidewalks and bike to make cities denser and require cities to enact smart growth plans and so forth. So, now, so that clearly says we need, we need a robust alternative to that plan, and we've been calling it Plan B. And, and, and we've been talking for the last year and a half to House Republicans in particular. Uh, and of course, now we're talking to the majority instead of the minority, and that, that makes a difference. We're saying, look, first thing is to set priorities. Federal government is doing way, way too many things in the name of transportation. You need to refocus the program, narrow it way down to what's truly federal. What's truly federal is interconnections among states. So the interstate system, which, as I said, needs now that it's more that it's becoming 50 years and, and 60 years old, needs to start being completely reconstructed. So there's a crucial need for a, a, a big program uh, to do that. 
And the second principle is that we should be revitalizing, restoring the user's pay, user's benefit principle, rather than uh, what a lot of uh, transportation people are saying, let's break down those silos in the US DOT and make all the money fungible so that they can hand it out wherever they uh, think they're going to get the most political benefits out of it. Key elements, uh, uh, Adrian and I visited with Jim Tymon, uh, uh, the uh, senior staffer uh, on the House Transportation Committee, who's really going to be involved uh, in writing the bill under Chairman Micah, uh, beginning of March. And one of the outcomes of that meeting is he says, well, why don't you guys put your heads together and tell us specifically what provisions would you like to see in the Plan B bill that the House Republicans will create and pass? Now, it doesn't guarantee they're going to put them all in. But uh, uh, so at the end of March, we sent them a memo, uh, a several page memo laying out an agenda. We said, fund the program at just the level that the gas tax brings in, the existing gas tax, because they've already said, no way, no how are they going to vote for an increase in the federal gas tax. So limit the size of the program to what the existing revenue brings in, completely eliminate this flexing nonsense so that highway money is to be spent on highways. We even said, uh, get rid of the transit funding, the transit account, and fund that out of general revenue. That's not going to happen. They're not going to do that. But we, we wanted to be true to principle and say it anyway and recommend it. Refocus the trust fund on the interstates and, and maybe on some of the other major interstate roads across state borders that carry a lot of truck traffic, the national highway system. And because you can't give the states more money, even though we know we need a whole lot more investment in highways, give them tools to leverage money to do tolling and public-private partnerships that, uh, that are proven to create a lot more value. So we, we crunched some numbers. This was in a report Adrian and I did last, uh, last summer. You could uh, get $11 billion a year more out of the existing federal gas tax for highway investment at the federal level if, if you eliminated urban transit and these enhancement programs and so forth that are, that are not. And the safety regulation shouldn't be paid for by highway users. All the other federal regulatory agencies are paid for out of general revenues. So why should highway users be singled out to have to pay for highway safety programs? Uh, and then we tried to look at, uh, if you had $11 billion a year more in federal money to invest, how much does that do towards solving the problem of rebuilding the interstates? Well, just some, some gross numbers here. Uh, there's 233 major bottlenecks on the interstate system that are mostly in urban areas, like in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has about five of those uh, uh, that are right near the top, in the top 10 or 12. Uh, rebuilding all of those is about a, over $100 billion uh, proposition. Uh, adding, Reason did a study about six years ago, adding networks of hot lanes, these express toll lanes like in Orange County uh, on, on, on State Road 91, in the 19 most congested metro areas is about $140 billion. That number probably is higher now because we've had inflation since then. There is no good estimate for completely reconstructing and modernizing the interstate system as a whole. Those two pieces above that I just gave you, the 128 and 139, would be part of that, but it's probably in the ballpark of one to two trillion dollars. So we're clearly going to need more than the current federal investment level, even if we refocus all of that existing money on highways. And that's why we also need tolling and public-private partnerships. Tolling would be a net new funding source in addition to the existing gasoline taxes. It's a true user fee. You can finance over a long period of time a long live asset like a highway uh, through tolling. Uh, and, uh, and, and this would be project finance only. It would not affect the state's bond ratings uh, because the money would be, uh, the asset is, the, the bonds are secured by the future toll revenues on those specific highways. Uh, this would be completely cashless. We, we, we no longer need to build. We will never build another toll booth in America. Uh, we're in the process of tearing them down, not to get rid of tolls, but to get rid of toll booths and using entirely nonstop electronic toll collection. Uh, and I think this is a politically feasible proposition if we add value in exchange for tolling. Add value means you do it for new highways, like between Las Vegas and Phoenix. You do it for major capacity additions to existing highways, which wouldn't exist unless there were the toll revenue uh, funding to do it. And you do it when you reconstruct a major highway, which wouldn't happen otherwise, maybe for the next 20 or 30 years while it gradually falls apart. In each case, you're adding value. You're not saying you get to just continue using the road you're using now, but you're going to pay a big toll for it. No, you only pay a toll if we're adding significant value in exchange for your paying the toll. Public-private partnerships, of course, reason this is a signature issue for us for more than uh, 25 years. 
for highways, these long-term private concessions are especially suited to mega projects, billion dollar scale projects. As Adrian mentioned, uh, with a true private public private partnership of this kind where you have a money making proposition, unlike high speed rail, the private sector in exchange for being able to collect tolls for say 50 years is willing to absorb construction risk. If it goes over budget, they eat it. The completion time risk, you know, they, they have a big incentive to get it finished on time because they can't collect any tolls until the project is open and, and cars and trucks are driving on it. And surprisingly, but importantly, the traffic and revenue risk. Uh, brand new toll roads, uh, uh, very, very hard to predict how many people are going to use them in the first five years. And uh, so there's a significant possibility that you will have less revenue in those early years than you need to pay the initial debt service. Private sector is willing to absorb those risks too for projects that make good sense. So there's a huge uh, uh, benefit to doing this. And also the, the, those highways that are funded in this way, it's interesting how the bond market works. Uh, if, if you want to sell somebody a toll revenue bond, they're going to insist on covenants in the agreement that protect their investment. The very first thing they require in those agreements is proper maintenance. Because who's going to pay a toll and use a road if it's not properly maintained over the long term? So that's the very first priority for the use of it. Before the investors actually get repaid on the debt service on the bonds, the first dollars go for proper maintenance. And they, and they monitor that. They have agents that monitor that you're doing that. So in just the last two years, during the credit markets crunch, we've had four big toll mega project funded and are under construction now in the United States. The Capitol Beltway outside of, of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the 595 project in Florida about a mile from my house, uh, the North Tarrant Express in, in Fort Worth, and the LBJ uh, uh, project in, uh, in Dallas. All of these are adding priced express lanes to existing urban interstates. And you can see the huge dollar values of that. That money is, is almost all based on the toll revenue financing. Now, tools, uh, uh, we had one other idea in here that because you know, they asked us, uh, what do you guys recommend we do about transit? You know, we said, first of all, you shouldn't be funding it with hiring money. But since we know it's going to continue uh, uh, to be federally funded, we said the best thing you could do to, is to change the direction of, of transit spending from these boondoggle light rail and heavy rail projects that, that attract a tiny fraction of, of, of users for a huge cost. Instead, bus rapid transit, BRT, uh, on, on hot lanes uh, is an obvious cost-effective solution. Uh, when you price these, these net new networks of lanes on your urban freeways and guarantee that they're uncongested at rush hour, that gives you a pathway for express buses to go fast and reliable in ways that buses that are currently using the carpool lanes, they get into the same kind of congestion on carpool lanes that we see now. So this could be a real win-win proposition. And I actually uh, uh, I had a 45-minute uh, teleconference with three senior officials of the US of the Obama administration DOT last week at their request to discuss this particular agenda of ideas. And I mean, they haven't said, yes, we're going to do it. But they seemed very, very interested. And I followed up with additional information they requested. So to wrap up and let you ask some questions, this year, with the federal reauthorization, the federal transportation program is at a fundamental crossroads. You have the administration plan that destroys the user pays, user benefit concept and transforms it into a slush fund for all kinds of other things than, than needed highway investment. Um, we have an alternative that we're working to craft with the House Republican majority. I think we'll get something very much along the lines of what we are proposing, although that's still being worked on. Uh, holding fast to the no gas tax increase uh, proposition gives us a, a lever to say, well, all right, we've got to refocus the investments on where it makes sense and not on federal projects to build sidewalks and bike trails. And that, but as a part of this, Congress must give the states the tools to do a lot more with tolls and public-private partnerships. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a good shot of getting a lot of that. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're open to <laughs>